Well, greetings, third graders. I am back for some more lunchtime reading with The Door in the Wall. Now you might notice that I am playing some medieval music. Maybe some monkish music from back in the Middle Ages. I might turn it down just a tad, but I hope you like that little touch. There we go. Okay, so we left off with Robin saying his prayers as Brother Luke had asked him to. Let's turn this down a little bit more. But I hope you can still hear it as I read. Okay. As the days grew warmer, the plague abated somewhat. That means it recessed somewhat. It wasn't as bad. Fewer people came to the hospital for care, and those who had not died became well and went to their homes. The cloisters were once more free of strangers, and the corridors cleared of beds and pallets. Early one bright morning, Brother Luke came for Robin, taking him on his back as before. See that thy hold is strong, he said, for I shall carry thee a good way. Tis good exercise for thine arms to make thee hold on, and will be good exercise for me too, carrying a great lad of ten. Robin laughed because he knew that he was small for his age. I have somewhat in mind for thee, said Brother Luke. He carried Robin in and out of halls and chambers, kitchen and parlor, cloisters and outer court, through refectory and almonry, stopping as always in the chapel to say a prayer. Then they went to the gardens as at the far side of the monastery. Here thy whittling will be more at home, said the friar, settling Robin in a small trundle cart and giving him the pieces of the little cross, which was almost finished. Brother Michael will welcome thee to his part of the garden when thou art weary of being here. Brother Matthew will look out for thee, and yonder is Brother David, the stonemason. Wilt look after Robin, he called to the monk in the carpenter shop. Brother Matthew nodded and left his work to examine what Robin was doing. Fret not, he said, I see he is one of us. Twill be a cross when tis done, said Robin in greeting, putting the two pieces together to show how they went. But how to fasten them I know not, could you tell me? I will surely, the monk assured him, but I have better tools. Come nearer where we can reach them. He moved the trundle cart close to the workbench where he found a chisel. So Brother Luke took him out to the gardens where he could work outside and he put him in a cart that could, it's almost like a wheelbarrow that they could move him around in. <clears throat> um, okay. So they found a chisel, I'm sorry. They found a chisel to work with, all right. Now we shall make a half joint so and fit it tightly, cutting each piece only halfway through the wood. So the cross piece will just fit into the upright one. He showed Robin how to hold the sharp tool and how carefully he must work so that it wouldn't go through the wood entirely. So now they're gonna chisel these little holes or little um, divots inside the, the beam of the cross so they can lay set the other piece into it with a chisel, okay. Then he explained, we shall secure it with fish glue and the dust which comes from using the rubbing stone to polish the wood will fill in the, last, the, the least crack and make all smooth. He went back to his work. Robin too went to work. It was exciting to use the sharp chisel. It slid easily into the wood, peeling off the smallest slivers which fell in a pleasant litter around him. Soon the square place appeared where the other piece of wood should fit. For some reason he did not know, Robin felt very content. For some reason, oh, I'm sorry, I just read that. He loved the smell of the wood he was whittling. Even the acrid smell of the oak, that means like bitter, even the bitter smell of the oak that Brother Matthew was working. He liked the sharp whistle of the plane as it slid over the board 
and the ringing sound of the chisel on stone from the mason's shed. Even the tiresome call of the cuckoo in the walnut tree was only a pleasant sound of summer. The sky above was like a garment of Our Lady, blue, gold, bordered. Robin stopped to rest, watching the birds that darted about the garden. He felt so strong that he was sure he soon would be able to get up and walk. He began to whistle and set to work again. For a long time, only these homely sounds were heard in the garden close, for the monks did not talk at their work. Then it happened. The sharp chisel slipped and cut a gash across the longer piece of the cross. It broke. Away flew the other piece as far as Robin could throw it, and after it went, the chisel so he threw the chisel and he threw the other piece of wood, narrowly missing Brother Matthew's head. Robin's face was drawn into a black cloud of anger, and if he had been able, he would have stormed out of the garden. But he was bound to stay where he was, so he took out his anger in words. Treacherous, misguided tool, he shouted. I'll have no more of you. Brother Matthew looked up in astonishment. "'Tis not the tool that is at fault, but thine unskilled hands,' he said quietly. "'If thou art to learn to use it, patience and care are better teachers than a bad temper. "'Think you I am but a carpenter's son and apprentice?' "'But as Brother Matthew kept his steady gaze on Robin, anger evaporated, disappeared. He covered his eyes with his arms and wished he had been truly a carpenter's son. Then his father would not have been away at the wars or his mother in waiting upon the queen. They would have been at home and he with them. Tomorrow is another day, comforted Brother Matthew. Take thy rest for now and thou wilt do better work next time. Here is Brother Luke coming to care for thee. I shall not tell him how nearly I lost my head. Brother Matthew's eyes twinkled as he reassured Robin, who had given him a questioning look. Later, while the good friar cared for him, rubbing his legs and back, working the muscles of his hands and arms, he said, I was tired, but now I feel better. You are very kind. I see thou art getting stronger. It may be that this rubbing helps thee. How? I know not. I am no physician. I am but a foolish friar, but it may stir up thy blood and make thee more comfortable. God's good time, his sunshine, and the love that is born thee are all healing. A bright spirit helps too, and that thou hast. Today in the garden, I felt that soon I should walk, said Robin. I must get well before my father returns from the wars. Whether thou will walk soon, I know not. This I know. We must teach thy hands to be skillful in many ways, and we must teach thy mind to go about whether thy legs will carry thee or no. For reading in another door, I'm sorry, Brother Luke is saying, for reading is another door in the wall. Dost you understand that, my son? So this is a really great line. He has already talked about a finding a door in the wall, right? Thinking about the walls that go around the castles and they're big. And if you uh, walk along the wall, you will eventually find a door to go inside in into the castle. <clears throat> and Brother Luke is saying that reading is another door in the wall. That means reading is another opportunity for Robin to um, do something with his mind without thinking about the fact that he couldn't walk. So he encourages him with that. He will teach him how to read. Robin smiled and nodded. Yes, he said, I see now what you mean by the door in the wall. We shall read together. Then there is somewhat of the earth and stars that Brother Hubert can tell thee how they go in their seasons, so that in summer, when we rise for the midnight office, Orion is here. You know what, I am gonna turn this off because it's going into um, something different. Okay, fixed it. 
Okay, so he's telling him that Brother Hubert can also show him the stars and tell him about constellations like Orion. All right, Orion is a hunter um, that is up in the stars, all right? Yet in winter, at the same hour, he is over there. So he's saying in summer he's here, but in the winter he's over there, and he can show him how that changes. Brother Luke stopped rubbing to point in different directions overhead as he went on. Some say that the earth extended just so far, then droppeth off into a vast sea. Perhaps it is so, I know not. But if it be so, how come the stars out again in their season? Who knows? Not I, but some day we shall know all. Will you teach me to write too and how to make letters as you promised, Robin asked. It sounds exciting now to learn and I wish to send a letter to my father. We shall begin today. We shall divide the days into teaching thy mind and teaching thy hands. Then weariness shall not give thee excuse for discouragement. Then Robin knew that Brother Luke had seen him throw the pieces of the cross and the chisel. Yet the friar or the monk neither spoke of it nor showed in any way that he was disappointed. Rest while I am gone, continued Brother Luke, and I shall bring quill and parchment to pen a letter for thee. It so happens that a hundred men at arms and a hundred foot soldiers have sworn to serve loyally their king and the city of London and are leaving for the Scottish border tomorrow. With them goes a minstrel, well known to us, his name is John Go in the Wind. He will be going with these soldiers to Scotland, and he is someone who delivers messages. He will gladly carry thy letter and put it into thy father's hands. He soon, he soon, Brother Luke soon returned with pen, ink pot, and parchment, and arranged them on the desk near Robin. So Brother Luke is going to pen, or he's going to write, a letter to Robin's father. <clears throat> and John, go in the wind, a messenger, will, will take it to him. Say this, Robin began, then went on to dictate the words as the monk penned them. Okay, here's what he wanted him to say. Sir John de Burford, that's the name of his father, from his son Robin, greeting it is a fine thing that your son Robin is left to the care of strangers. Had it not been for Brother Luke, who is writing this letter, I should be dead. As you know, my lady mother had been commanded to attendance on the queen at Windsor, and I was left to await the coming of John the Fletcher in the care of Dame Ellen. Just before the feast of St. Matthew, the 24th of February, I woke one morning unable to rise from my bed, being very ill, so that when John the Fletcher came to take me to the Lord Peter de Lindsay's castle in Shropshire, I was unable to go. Remember, Lord Peter is where he, Robin was supposed to go to learn to become a knight. So he's telling his father that he was unable to go. Wherefore, he sent a physician to care for me, who came not again but left me, as before, in Dame Ellen's care. <clears throat> the men at arms are with you, as well you know. The house servants, even old Gregory, have left our service, for the plague had them. Ellen, too, was taken of it, and I was left alone and helpless. My legs are as useless as two sausages, bent ones. Now I am in the care of this good brother at St. Mark's. How then shall I do? Send me a letter, I beg you, and farewell. And so that was the letter that he had Brother Luke write for him to his father. Now attend, said Brother Luke. I shall read this slowly, pointing out each letter and word, so this may be my, thy first lesson. The two heads bent over the parchment together. Robin's dark and thickly hair and Brother Luke's tonsured thatched. Oh, said Robin, you have made it look like poetry with red capitals. So now they're, they're going over the letter and Brother Luke is showing him 
how uh, he's giving him his first lesson of reading and writing by looking at the letter that he wrote. Yes, agreed Brother Luke, but when it is read to thee, twill not sound like poetry? I'll vow, thou hast not minced words in thy letter. Slowly and carefully he spelled out the letter to Robin, who would not change a word of it, but signed his name with Brother Luke guiding his hand. The friar folded it and took it to the scriptorium to seal before sending it off, then gave it to John Go in the Wind, who waited. And that is the end of that chapter. All right, you guys are going to be on a spring break now, and that means we won't be able to listen to our book for um, over a week. But I will refresh you when we get back together and remind you of what we've already talked about. All right, I don't know if I will talk to you, but um, after this, before your spring break. So I am here to just say, have fun with your families, have fun outside. It looks like it's gonna be beautiful weather. And know that Mrs. Simonowski prays for each one of you individually. All right, okay, take care. <laughs>